Yeah, that's great, that's great. You know, starting this weekend, we are starting a new sermon series called This is Living. And I believe it's a familiar statement to all of us because, you know, I'm wearing a t-shirt that, that has this title, This is Living. And, and this tea was being sold in March, during the March Out campaign. And it is a declaration back then for our use, for all of us here to be able to experience true living in Christ when we step out in faith outside of the four walls of the church. And the Lord has placed upon our hearts as a youth ministry to carry on this team in the form of sermon series to talk about what true Christian living is all about. And right now, I just want you to take out your bulletin and you can see that that at the youth bars right there, there's all the different sermon titles for, for This Is Living. And this is, this is Living sermon series is a book study of Colossians. Okay? And the book of Colossians teaches us principles for living a Christian life in a non-Christian culture. And often, as Christians, we are called to stand against the tide of a public opinion or even popular trends. And we are called to be in the world, but not of the world. How many of you can say an amen to that? And this is living, it's a call for every one of us here to live counter-cultural lives. And our lives are not meant to live according to the flow of the world, but to stand against the values of the devil and to declare that Jesus reigns in our lives. How many of you can say an amen to that? And let's turn our Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, verse 1 to 14. And this is the scripture that we're going to walk through even for this sermon today. And let's read it together. All right? Are you ready to read it together? One, two, three. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the world, the whole world just as He has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You will learn it from Ephesus, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we have heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of His holy people in the kingdom of light. For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's just look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we give thanks. And I want to declare that in this sermon series, this is living. I want to ask that your word, your truth in the book of Colossians, is not just for us to be informed, but it is for us to be transformed from the inside out. And I want to declare that, Lord, grant us spiritual understanding of your word. So that, Lord, that we can truly live out the life that you have called us to. So Lord, I want to declare right now, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We affirm your presence in this place. And I ask that you open up our spiritual eyes to see and open up our spiritual ears to hear from you. So that today, that we will respond to you that our life and our lives will be transformed. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen, Amen. You see, the book of Colossians was written by Paul in the 1860s, when he was in prison, in, in, in the Rome prison for two years. And in the prison, Paul here received news that some people within the church of Colossae, okay, they, 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 were, they, was in, they were introduced a new doctrine, which exalted knowledge above everything else. And this new knowledge, this new doctrine has little to do with Christ. 
and they claim that as long as a person has this special knowledge, this person can do whatever he wants and whatever he pleases and whatever he likes. Okay, basically, it is a mixture of Judaism, paganism, and, and this new doctrine, okay, it reduced the, the importance of Christ greatly. And Ephesus, the disciple of Paul, had founded the church at Colossae. But he, was un, he and the church was under constant pressure due to this new doctrine infiltrating the city of Colossae and infiltrating the church and influencing the church as well. And that's why in his writing to the Colossians, Paul expounded many important doctrines to them. And let's look at verse 9 and 10. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote. He says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. And Paul was essentially telling the church that he prays for them in a regular basis. And he goes on to say, We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way. Can you just turn to the friend on your right and say, Please Him in every way. You know why he, made, he said this? It's really because the new doctrine that is infiltrating the church, you know, is teaching them that they can do whatever they like and whatever they please. And, and they don't really care about whether they, their life is, can please God or not. And that's why the Apostle Paul was so concerned about them because he knows that as disciples of Christ, we should live lives that's worthy of the Lord and pleasing to Him in every way. That's why the title of this sermon in this sermon series is called Pleasing God. Why don't you turn to people around you and say, Pleasing God. You see, as Christians, our greatest desire should be to please our Heavenly Father. You see, to please someone is to make the person satisfied, to make the person happy. And our greatest desire as disciples of Jesus Christ is to make God happy. How many of you can say an amen to that? And it is not to make ourselves happy or not to make others happy, but to make God happy should be our, our ultimate goal in life. You see, when we truly desire to please God in every way, we will truly live a life that is worthy of the Lord and we are able to please Him in every way. And with that, we will counter the culture of the world. And if we desire, truly desire to please God in every single way of our lives, I want you to know that you will love Him enough to make a difference in your actions, in your thoughts, and in the way that you live. I'm not too sure about you, but how many times have you, caught, have you found yourself making this prayer? Lord, help us to live in a way that truly pleases you. And, it, and, and my life, please and be accepting to you. How many of you, you have made that prayer? Just put up your hands. That you always make that prayer? Hey, don't. Uh, hey, come on. Eh. One, two, three. Put up your hands. How many of you have made this prayer before? You know, often we will, for me, I will make this prayer. I say, God, in all the things that I do, Lord, I pray that you'll be pleasing to you. I pray that you, you will be acceptable to you. But often, when I believe that when we think about this aspect, often we'll think about the external aspect. Maybe some of you are thinking right now, hey, for me to please God in my life is to come to cell group, is to come to youth service regularly. And maybe for some of you, your, your, your idea of pleasing God is to read the Bible every day and to pray to God every single day. And maybe for some of you, your idea of pleasing God is to say that, God, I will not smoke, I will not drink, and I will not be friends who have bad influence. Well, all that I've said is important. It's, I'm not saying that it's not important. And it is the kind of life that I hope that all of us will live it out. But the question to all of us is this. Are these truly the things that are most important to God? Are these things that please Him the most? And well, in, in Paul's opening remarks in his letter to Colossian Christians, he talks about this matter of pleasing God. And today, I want to share with all of us three evidences of a life that truly pleases God. Are you ready to know what are three evidences? 
Are you ready to examine your life? If you're ready to examine your life, come on, make some noise. Woo! What is the first evidence that your life is pleasing to the Lord? It is when you are fruitful. Why don't you say with me, I am fruitful. God is pleased when I am fruitful. Okay, can you say louder? Come on. Say with me, God is pleased when I am fruitful. You look at verse 10. It says, so that we may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. You see, let's go back to verse 6, where Paul commended the church for the fruitfulness they had shown. In verse 6, it says, In the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You see, the Christian life ought to be a fruitful life. In other words, there should be evidence in your life that will show the whole world that you have a real relationship with God and that is proof, there's evidence that, that when anyone looks at you, they'll say to you, oh yes, you are truly a Christian. You are a disciple of Christ. And a fruitful life pleases God. Let's just say that you, you want to plant two durian trees. How many of you love durians here? Make some noise, come on. A lot of us, love. how many of you don't like durians? Boo, come on, boo. Boo, all right, durians. Let's just say that you love durians so much, you want to plant durians somewhere, okay? You, plant, you try to plant two durians. Do you know that if you want to plant durians right, for any durian tree to bear fruit, you, they, the tree will only bear fruit, bear durian fruit, huh? after four to five years. Okay, it's not immediately you plant, huh? one month later you have durian tree. It's not so simple one. It, it takes time. And in fact, it takes years. So let's just say that you have two, you planted two durian fruits and you spend a lot of effort planting it. You try to fertilize it. And by the time you hit the fifth year, you, went, you go to your durian tree. And when you look at the durian tree, you realize that one has a lot of Mao Shan Wang. Woo! Wow! How ta li da. Okay? Big size, good durians. Wow! You can earn a lot of money. And when you look at the other durian tree, you realize there is none at all. And most is so small. Okay? It seems like toy durian. Spoiled one. Okay? But let me ask you this question. Which of these two durian trees will you be pleased with? Which one? How many of you, you find that the one that bears no fruit, you are pleased with one? Put out hands. Wow, you are pleased with one. God bless you, man. How many of you think that the tree with fruits, you are very pleased with one? You're so happy. Come on, wave at me. You all need to respond to me, okay? So that your, your spirit is alert. Well, the answer is obvious. We will be all pleased with the durian tree that bears the, the most fruit. And likewise, God is pleased when we bear fruit in our lives. And our fruitfulness is important to God. Let me point all of you back to verse 6 in the New Living Translation. This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives just as it changed your life from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. You know, to put it simply, I would say a fruit is a changed life. A Christ-centered life. A life where you have died to yourself so that Christ can live in you. A life that seeks to please God rather than self or rather than people. A life that is focused on serving God and your focus and your priority is God. If I look at you right now, is your life changed? When your friends look at you, when your parents look at you, versus one year ago, two years ago, has your life been changed by the gospel? In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 25, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You see, if you are truly living out the Christian life, 
you'll be characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. Are you producing the fruit of the Spirit in your life? If I look at you right now, am I able to see love? Or when I look at you, I can only see bitterness and hatred. If I look at you right now, am I able to see the fruit of joy in your life? Or there's a lot of gloom and, and sadness in your life. If I look at you right now, am I able to see peace, the fruit of peace in your life? Or there's a lot of worries in your life. If I look at you right now, am I able to see the fruit of humility, the fruit of meekness in your life? Or when I look at you, I can only see, can only see pride and arrogance. If I look at you right now, am I able to see the evidence of self-control in your life? Or when I look at you, I only see that you're a victim of your passions, that you're addicted to so many things of the world. And if you're truly a Christian, if you're truly a disciple of Christ, and when I look at you, and anyone who looks at you, they will be able to find fruit in your life. You know why? Because a disciple of Jesus Christ will produce spiritual fruit. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 8, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, by their fruits, you will know them. Let us pause for a moment right now and reflect upon our own lives. Are others, are the people around you able to identify the fruit in your life? Are they able to see that your life has been transformed by God? Why don't you look at your cell leader right now? Your handsome, beautiful cell leaders, don't laugh at them. But when you look at them, are you able to ask them, are you able to see the fruit in my life? Am I changed by, by God? Well, let give them some time to answer you after the service. But you need to truly know what is the honest answer from them. And the same thing goes to you in your cell group when you look at all your brothers and sisters, when you look at them, you really need to ask, I realize this thing, you know, many of us, we don't really ask our brothers and sisters in Christ, hey, if you look at me, uh, do you see the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit? Have I changed to become more and more like Christ? I, I think that this is a question that you all should be asking. You know, one of the things I realized that, that in, 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 in this uh, spiritual family, the moment you stop asking your friends about your own life, I can tell you that is the time where nobody is checking on you. Because I believe your, those friends who's closest to you will know whether there's the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And I want you to know that people of the world are watching you. Your classmates are looking at you. And they are listening to you. And I hope that you're pointing them to Jesus. And that is the first evidence that I want to talk to you about. That if your, your life truly pleases God, you'll be able to live a life that is fruitful, a life that is changed by God from the inside out. And what is the second evidence? And if you truly, the second evidence of a life that is pleasing to God is when your life, when you are fervent. Say with me this statement, God is pleased when I am fervent. Say it louder. La. God is pleased when I am fervent. In verse 10, it says, you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of Christ. You know, I strongly believe that when the Apostle Paul made this statement, growing in the knowledge of God, I believe that it's a spirit of fervency. You see, the word fervent comes from the Greek word ziontes. Say with me, ziontes. Which literally means boiling. Boiling. Your spirit is boiling. There's a fire within you. And, and if you truly, if your life is one that truly pleases God, I can tell you when God looks at you, there is a fervency in you. In other words, God is pleasing you with you 
when you're boiling in your spirit and say, God, I want to know you in my life. I want to know your will. I, I thirst and I hunger for you. Lord, look at the passion that I have. It's boiling. I want to know you. And I hope that when I look at every single one of you, there is this boiling in your spirit. Come on, can you just look around every, at everyone else? Is it boiling within or not? Or, or, or the water in, within you has become lukewarm? Or, or water in you has become has mosquitoes breeding in it already? Or the water within you has boiled and there's nothing to boil? But I want you to know that our greatest passion and greatest ambition in life is to know God. Can I hear an amen to that? That's so why if you look at verse 9, I want to point you all back to verse 9. That's why the Apostle Paul, he says, he have been praying for them regularly, and he says, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will. And I pray, and I ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. He's, made, he's telling you, it's this prayer, and this is the same pr prayer, that as a pastor, as a leader, that I want to make to all of you, I pray that God will fill you with the knowledge of His will. You know why? If you look at the context of what's happening in, in the church of Colossae, the believers there, the disciples there are being filled with the knowledge of the world. The knowledge of the world is constantly bombarding them. They are flowing along with what the world is teaching them. And that is why the Apostle Paul tells them, I'm praying for you right now. That, I will, that God will fill you with the knowledge of His will so that you can stand against the tide of public opinion, so that you can stand against the tide of the world. Come on, clap unto the Lord, come on. You all want to clap, you all just clap. Huh? And this is my prayer for all of you, and this is the prayer of all your leaders and your parents as well. And I want you to know this, as much as Paul wants to pray for the church. As much as we, as your pastor and your, your leader, we pray that, that God will fill you with the knowledge of His will, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But I want you to know it will not happen unless on your part, there is a, there is a fervency within your spirit to want to grow in the knowledge of God. And it has to come from you. I can pray as much as I can. But if you do not do your part of knowing God in your life, I can tell you, the doctrines of the world will infiltrate your life and you'll walk out of God's will and purposes for you. And I want you to know that God is not pleased with lukewarmness. He's not pleased when you are half-hearted. God is not pleased if there's a lack of zeal and passion in your life. Is your spirit lacking in zeal? Is your spirit lukewarm? Or is it boiling? Or is there a spirit of fervency within you? Are you fervent in knowing God or not? I'm not too sure, you know. And only you are able to answer that question. You see, often we develop an image of God that pleases us. Really. And I want you to know that if FCBC were to start a workshop, and this title of this workshop is called Do It Yourself Theology. And in this Do It Yourself Theology, I tell you, hey, hello, come, come and join this workshop. And in this workshop, I will teach you how to develop a, con a concept of God that will truly please you. How many of you would want to come? Put up hands. Or how many of you, you confirm won't come on. If your friends go for it, you'll, you'll punch them. Have a look. But often, we develop a concept of God that we can live with. We develop our own image of God in our lives. And I want you to know that this is not the way to approach God. And we cannot stand before God and say, you know, God... You're here to please me. Follow my will. 
But I pray that every one of you here, your attitude is this, that God, reveal yourself to me. Show me your ways. You know, recently, we, at a, during the G12 Asia conference, I was just hosting some of the Burmese delegates. And I was just talking to one of our members, uh, church members, I think she's working as a social worker. And she just told me, and I just, uh, you're just, this, just talking, uh, because I was just waiting uh, for the rest of the Burmese pastors, and they were having their dinner, I was just talking to her, and she was just sharing with me that, hey, pastor, you know that I'm going to change job. I said, oh, you change job? Ah? I thought you were very comfortable with your job. And, he, and she told me this, you know, she, she prayed to God. He said, God, I sense that you, you want me to change my job, but I'm very comfortable. And if truly you want me to change job, why don't you bring me to a job that, that is not something that you want me to be in? And not something that I like and I get in, but it's something that you want me to be in regardless whether I like the job or not, but I want to know that that is the job that you have for me and that is the job that you want me to walk according to your will and your purpose. And when I heard her say that, oh, I just felt that God was very pleased with her because she doesn't want to do things according to her own will. She doesn't want to do things according to what pleases her, but she wants to do what, whatever it takes to please God. And I want to pray for every single one of you here that you will have that spirit that says, God, I want to know your will for my life. I want to know who you are in my life. I want to walk according to what you, your, your plans, the plans that you have for me. So, young people, I want to encourage you to continue to grow in the knowledge of God. And I pray that in this community here, that you all will boil within your spirit to know God. So I want to turn to the friends around you and say, Know God! And there's a second evidence. That if you want to live a life that truly pleases God, that you will be able to see that there's a spirit of fervency within your life. And this leads us to the third evidence. And the third evidence is simply this. If you want God to be pleased with your life, then you must be faithful. Say this with me as loud as you can. God is pleased, God is pleased. When, I when I am faithful. In verse 11, okay, after we talk about please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. You see, it is not enough to start well. God wants us to finish well. How many of you want to finish strong in this race? Come on. Hey, okay, let me ask you this important question again. Huh? How many of you want to finish this race well? Put up your hands. Okay, great. All right, I see that you're responding to me. That's great. And this requires faithfulness on our part. And that's why the reason, that's the reason why Paul prayed for the church to have great endurance and patience. Why do you need endurance and patience? It's because the road ahead is long. It's a long journey of faith. And that's why it requires faithfulness. And faithfulness truly pleases God. How many of you can say an amen to that? You see, sometimes our lives... Yeah, it's good. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes everything seems to go right. Sometimes everything seems to go wrong. Sometimes everything seems to go our way. And there are times where it seems that everything is coming against us. But I want you to know that God is pleased with you when you are faithful in the good times and the... And God is pleased with you when you are faithful. When everything seems to be going right or everything seems to be coming against you. And God is pleased with you when you are faithful, when everything seems to be going wrong in your life. And I want to encourage you, whether in the ups and the downs of your life, be consistent, be faithful to what God has called you to do. Do not ever, ever give up. 
So why don't you turn to the friends on your left and say, do not give up. And the friend on your right say, be faithful. Or what do you say? Must give up what? Okay. They are not giving up on you, okay? That's why they are, you're seated in between them. <laughs> Just joking. And I know that some of you will say, Pastor, and this is something that I've experienced as well. You may say that, no, Pastor, I find it tough, lah. That I find it hard to be faithful to God, you know. Because there are many times in my life I have failed God. Time and time again I feel God. And I I think it may come to a point where I want to give up. I want I don't want to run this race anymore. Pastor, I, I want to be faithful. But I keep failing God. I really feel uncertain. You know, if that's who you are, I want you I want to point you to the truth in the Bible. In verse 11, it says, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you might have a great endurance and patience. What does it mean when Apostle Paul prays this over the church? Being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might. What is the, this truth that the Apostle Paul is telling us? He's trying to tell all of us here, if you try to live your life in your own power, you will fail. It's difficult for you to be faithful. But if you yield yourself to God, He will fill you with strength and power and give you the ability to endure. How many of you can get and say an amen to that? Amen. Can we just give praise to God? Hey, the Word of God, it did not say, hey, I, that, that you will have great endurance and patience. And when you have that, God's power and strength will be upon you. It did not say that. But rather it says that God's strength and power is upon your life. And there will be great, and as you do that, there will be great and, and great endurance and patience so that you can be faithful to God. You know, this reminds me of a story, and often it's the same thing that I I, I see at home. You know, there's this boy, okay, he's he's trying to fix his bicycle. And well, he tried many times just to fix his bicycle. The wheel just keep falling off. The chains just keep falling off. And he, he keeps doing it, you know, for almost a day. And he decided to just throw the toolbox on the floor and throw the bicycle away. And he said to the father, Father, I decided to give up. I, I, I failed. I cannot fix this bicycle. And... And the father looked at him, have you tried, your, have you tried everything? He said, yes, I've tried everything. And the father turned to him and said, have you asked me? And the son said, no. What am I trying to tell you? God wants us to endure to the end. God wants us to be faithful to the end. And the only way that we can do is to trust Him. Is to ask of Him. That is power, that is strength be upon our lives. And that we do not run this race on our own. And we can only be faithful when we stop depending on our own strength, our own ability. But we need His power in our lives. And today it's time for you to ask God. Ask God. That's why it says in verse 11, God strengthen me with all power according to your glorious might so that I can be faithful. I'm not too sure if that describes you, but if that's who you are and you're discouraged, you want to be faithful but you feel uncertain. But today, God's encouragement to you is that today, come and ask of Him. Come and trust Him so that you can be faithful. What are the three evidence to, in your life that will truly please God? The first evidence is when you are, that when you're fruitful, when your life is changed from the inside out by the values of God, by the truth of God, 
and there is no evidence of the world in your life. And what is the second evidence? That is when you are fervent, that you have a strong desire within you to know God for yourself and not to know God from your leaders or from your parents. But when you have this fervency within you to know God, I want, I want you to know that you'll be able to stand against the culture of this world. And the third evidence is that when you are, when you are faithful, that God is pleased with you when you are faithful, that when you keep on pressing on, when the circumstances in front of you is tough, and when you press on to the end, I want you to know that God is, God is pleased with you. Have I ended my sermon? Is it early? Hey, how, you're like, can I, can I? But I just want to end off this sermon by telling you more stories, okay? Because I realize that I think to share more stories with all of you, I want to share with you three stories, okay? Very quickly, because I want to, to have more time for you to respond to God. And these three stories are stories of people who simply want to live a life that pleases God. And the first story that I want to share with you is the story of Daniel. Okay, if you turn your Bible to the book of Daniel, Daniel, you realize that Daniel and his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Azariah are very good examples of what it means to live a Christian life in a non-Christian culture. And, and if you look at Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. And back then, for them, they truly desire want to obey God. And they are so disciplined to want to please God in every situation and circumstance. And when they know that they are supposed to consume the royal food, to them, this is a no-no. Because they will be defiled. They will, they will not please God. And that's why he asked for permission not to defile himself. And we carry on in verse 11 and 12, he says, Daniel said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel and his three friends, Please test your servant for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. With what you see. And what happened? When they decided that they want to please God, they do not want to disobey God. And if you look at, and they, the only thing, they, they want to stay away from this royal food. Because they know that when they eat that, they will be, def they will be defiled. And if you read in verse 15, in Daniel chapter 1, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Amazing. Can we just give praise to God? Come on. Woo! You see, they were not afraid at all. And they are just so focused on pleasing God in their lives. And this is only the first test. Okay? The second test is this. When in Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. He commanded everyone from different nations, different languages to worship their gold image. And in verse, chapter 3, verse 6, it says, Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Wow! They'll be set on fire. And what happened? Do you think they, they decided to bow down before this idol? No. Because for them, they know that as Israelites, they are commanded to serve God alone. And all idols are forbidden. And which means that this, this image that Nebuchadnezzar has made, they are not supposed to worship it. And they were threatened with death. And despite knowing the punishment that they will face from the king, they still stand firm in their faith. And in verse 16, it says, this is what he said to King Nebuchadnezzar. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter if we are thrown into the blazing furnace. The God we serve is able to deliver us from it and He will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if He does not, we want you to know that your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of God 
it was set up. And what happened after this? What happened? It's a matter of life and death. But yet they choose to disobey the king. They were thrown into the furnace and it was heated seven times hotter. And the furnace was so hot that it, it killed the people, the soldiers that, who took up these three friends into it. And what happened? In verse 25, it says, Look, I see four men walking around in fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son, a son of the gods. You see, the blazing furnace didn't kill them at all. And God protected them simply because it's the desire to please God and to obey Him. And this is what happens, you know, in our lives when we trust God. The power of God will be evident in your life. And the final test for Daniel is this. In one of the final tests in chapter 6 is that these people, they were so en they're envious of Daniel and they wanted to harm him, okay? But they couldn't find any evidence against Daniel because he was faithful. If you look at his life, there's nothing. There's nothing to find fault with. And in verse 4, it says they could not find, they find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. And what happened? This wicked man persuaded the king of Babylon to come up with a new decree, a new law that they can only pray to the king but not to any other gods for the next 30 days. And what was Daniel's response? If you look in verse 10, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home immediately, okay, to his upstairs room where the windows opened wow, towards Jerusalem. Wow. Hey, come on, more dramatic. And he got down on his knees to pray. Uh, can you, wow, the, the atmosphere, the feeling. And three times a day, he continued to pray on his knees, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before, you know. He's consistent. Regardless of what situation, he continued to do the same. And right at the end of it, what happened? Because of his desire to please God, he was condemned to the lion's den. And this is what, and he was condemned to lion's den. And the end result is this, where he is in, into a cage where, wow, there's lions. I, I mean, that's ferocious. Huh? Sure, go in, it will become their lunch. But in verse 22, this is what Daniel replied to the king. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, your majesty. God protected him. The power of God was evident in his life when he decided to go against what the king wanted to do. Daniel was putting God first above all, even in his own life. And he's even risking his life. And I want you to know that right at the end, Daniel became prosperous. And this is the kind of life that every one of us should be living. A life that pleases God, a life that decides to counter the culture of this world. That you may think in your eyes of flesh, that you may think that, that you are at disadvantage. But I want you to know that if you know that your desire is to please God in every way, God will not short change you. How many of you can say amen to that? I want to... And, and this is just the first story, a biblical story. I want to share two more stories, but two testimonies from Zheng Jie and Samantha. And recently I was, uh, I think it was just on Sunday, we had a BBGB meeting with all the officers and captains. And I was just hearing the story, hearing the testimony. And I was just so touched because they really showed me what it means to live a life the desires to please God in every way. And if you look at what they are doing right now, I can tell you it's counterculture. Definitely. They are not flowing with, with, with the, the ideas of this world. Uh, first, I want to share with you Zheng Jie's story. 
This is what he said. Okay, he's the one in the center. I came to hear of the gospel when I was a BB cadet in my secondary school. I accepted Christ in sack four when things at home and at school started to take a toll on me. Growing up in BB for five years in secondary school, I've learned that people are capable to change, grow and mature. And because I went through being changed, grown and matured, I know that it is possible for the kids who may deem as bad and hopeless to grow too. As, and that's what struck me, the limitless potentials that BB brings about impacting young lives. The fact that we have the platform to introduce to them who Jesus is and how He can change and impact our lives is what made me drawn into the BB ministry. Even after I graduated from school and went to work, I've been serving for about three years in BB as an officer, now in a secondary school BB company sponsored by FCBC. My service is limited due to work, but in as much, I try to be available to serve when there is a call to. So far, okay, this is what he said, I've taken about 10 days of leaves this year to serve in running BB Parade on a Friday afternoon. So which means that half day, lah, okay? Maybe you take half day, 20, 20 weeks he's in the school on a Friday afternoon. And I usually take half day off so that I can maximize my annual leave to serve in BB. And usually after parade, it's fellowship time with the, the boys. They're able to hang out for dinner in order to be friends and reach out to them. To me, my work is secondary and God's work is primary. And if I'm task called to make sacrifices for the sake of 30 over boys each year, I think a few days of annual leave means nothing. Can we just thank God for His life? This is a great encouragement to me. You know, serving in the boys' brigade and the girls' brigade is tough because it's on, most of it is on a weekday afternoon. And if you are a BB boy, GB girl yourself, or consider serving in one of the companies sponsored by FCBC. But what he did touched me, you know. He didn't, I'm not too sure how many leave he has. Maybe he has only 14 days of leave. But up till now, he took 10 days of leave. Normally, many, I believe many people who took leave is simply to go for holiday, to enjoy. But for him, to him, the work in the boys' brigade is his primary work. It's what God has called him to do. And he took 10 days of leave. And I want you to know that many officers and many members of our church, when they serve in the boys' brigade and the girls' brigade, they took leave. And this is what I mean by counterculture. And, and that is what I believe will touch the lives of the boys as well. They will bear fruit. They will see, that he will see lives that will be changed. And the next story I want to share with you is a testimony of Samantha. And this is what she says. I joined the girls' brigade in secondary one after much pursuit by my seniors. I remember how much a bunch of seven GB seniors would come looking for me at school all day just so I would come and try their CCA session. Looking at how close these people are to one another and the pursuit of one lost sheep got me where I am. The most significant part of being a GB girl was the challenge to take up leadership roles despite how inferior and insignificant I felt I was. The efforts and the heart behind all that was invested in me gave me a perspective shift of who a leader can be and who I can become. From then, I desired to touch lives just like how I was, how, how I was impacted. I've been serving in the Girls' Brigade 86 company for six years now. I run weekly CCA sessions, prepare girls for competition and plan camps. More than all the programs, I enjoy being physically present for my girls. Ever since I started serving, it is a challenge to be physically present. GB takes place on Friday afternoon at about 2pm. It clashes with my school and work timetable. I would often go to God in prayer, telling Him how much I desire to be on the ground and believing that He will pave the way when He calls us. From then, I've been experiencing miracle after miracle while I was still in polytechnic. Some lessons miraculously ended earlier. Now when, I was, and now when I'm working, I thank God I was placed in the morning shift despite having very low possibilities. And His goodness and providence built up my faith. Due to the structure of my workplace, one would usually be placed in the morning shift for uh, only two years. I began to seek God for directions. I'm uh, sensing that I ought to continue serving in GB. After all, I've been the sole officer on the ground recently with no successor yet. Although serving in GB has been so dear to me, I love, I love anything and everything about my current workplace too. 
This struggle caused me to contemplate. And at the G12 conference this year, I was so certain that the direction from God to continue serving in Girls' Brigade. I have never been so certain in my life. Okay, this is what she said. And God spoke to me about giving him full control, 100%. And when Pastor Bray shared that going is knowing, I know within that is it. Going is a demonstration of knowing who God is and who I am in Him. Going is knowing the power of His words. Going is knowing how much more He can do and will provide. And I really don't know what is to come but in Him and I trust and I obey. Can we just give thanks for her life? Come on, let's just praise God. You know, when we hear a testimony, we must be so thankful to the Lord. You know what I heard from her? She wants to change job so that she can be free on a Friday afternoon just to serve in a GB company. And that is her. And this is how our lives, how we should live our lives. That when you live a life that truly wants to please God, I can tell you, you will see miracles, you will see signs and wonders following you. But I want you to know that when you truly desire to please God, you will never ever flow with the things of the world. Why is it that many of us, we are flowing along with the things of the world? We are caught up by the things of the world. We backslide so easily. It's simply because deep within each one of us, we have no desire to please God at all. You know, one of the things I also want to share, even you know, last time when I was a teacher, I really, you know, one of the things that I, I dislike is, I dislike missing out on conference. Okay? So there was one Friday night, I remember, whole Friday, that I had a school event, you know. I said, God, how come there's a school event? I want to go for the conference. Because there's something boiling within me, you know. I want to know God. But, and I want to know, I want God to speak to me through the conference. But there is a school event. And I said, God, you need to help me. What should I say to my principal? You know what God told me? You go to Him and this is what you should say. So I went to my principal and this is what I said. I said, Sir, I know today, tonight we have an important school event. Uh, but I have an important religious conference to go to. Can I be excused? Yeah, it's very important to me. If I don't go, uh, I, I will feel burnt out as a teacher. <laughs> No, really, I told him that. And he said, go ahead. I, you can be excused. All my colleagues in school, but I go for a conference. Praise God. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Hey, hello. Hey, hello. I'm not teaching you to pontan. Huh? I'm teaching you to please God. You understand? I always say, I, I need to attend a religious conference. Religious re harmony, but anyway. This... No, this is how I do it. When God prompts me, la, not suka suka every day, religious conference, right? Okay? So, no such thing. And I want to encourage all of you that today you need to decide that your life, in every single way, please God. Not to please yourself, not to please others, but to please God. And I was just preparing for this sermon. I think in, in the social media, I, you know, Dr. Michael Brown, Recently, there was a post that he put. I, I, I like to hear him talk. It's amazing. He's always counterculture. This is what he said. This is the quote. The more our culture runs counter to God, the more committed I am to being a Jesus-centered counterculture revolutionary. Amen. The more our culture runs counter to God, the more you should be committed to please God, to be God-centered in your life. Don't because in your school, your, all your friends are doing things that is the values of the world you just follow. No! All the more you must be committed to have Christ in the center of your life and to please Him. That in all the things that you do, you must ask God, God, is this what I'm doing pleasing to you? If it's not pleasing to you, I will not do it. Because I want to be, I want to be fruitful in my life. 
I want to be found having that fervor in my life knowing you. I want to be found faithful. You know, friends, who's here with us for the very first time, who have never ever given your life to Jesus, you know, I want you to know that if you do not know God in your life, you are basically flowing along with the things of the world. Whatever the world does, you will just flow along. You will never be able to find a, a, your own identity because your identity will be that of the world. But today, I want you to know that there is a solution. And that solution is to come to know God who loves you and who desires to have a personal relationship with you. And maybe you're asking me right now, Pastor, whatever they're talking about, I want to know this God. Today, I can help you to know God. Today, I can help you to have that personal relationship with God. And, and this is what you're going to do. In a moment's time, I want you to pray along with me. And when you make that prayer, I want you to know that God, that, that when you make that prayer, God will remove all the sins in your life the sin that you have committed, God will forgive you. And I want you to know that when you, when you say that, Jesus, I believe that you have died for me on the cross, when I acknowledge that I'm a sinner, when I acknowledge that you are my Lord and Saviour, I want you to know that you will receive eternal life, that your name will be written in the book of life. And, and I want you to know that in this world, I can tell you, you'll find that when you know Jesus in your life, your life will be purposeful and meaningful because you know this God who created you from the inside out, who knows you by name. So can I have every one of us to close our eyes and to bow our head? And today I want to encourage all our friends who have never ever given your life to Jesus. And I want you to make this prayer together with me. And all I need you to do is to just to close your eyes right now and I'm going to lead you in a, a prayer. And this prayer is designed for you to receive Jesus into your life. And all you need to do is to follow me word for word, line by line. And when you say all that, that is a prayer. And I want you to mean it with all your heart. And I can tell you, your life will be transformed forever. Because with that prayer, you'll come to, to, to know that you can have a personal relationship with God and God has great plans for your life and you need not flow along with the culture of this world so I'm going to pray right now and I want you to pray together with me and I want the rest of us who's, who are Christians here to pray as loud as you can so that your friend, the friends here who are making this prayer for the very first time will feel supported so I'm going to pray right now and I want all of you to pray together with me. Dear Father in heaven, Dear Father in heaven, thank you for bringing me here. Thank you for bringing me here. I believe it is a divine appointment. I believe it's a divine appointment. Today, today, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And I believe that Jesus Christ, and I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. Died on the cross for me. And so that I can have eternal life. So, so that I can have eternal life. And my sins are forgiven. And my sins are forgiven. And I right now. Right now. I confess. I confess that Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is my personal Lord. Is my personal Lord and Savior. And Savior. Jesus. Jesus. I give my life to you. I give my life to you. Show me the plans. Show me the plans that you have for me. That you have for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. With all our eyes closed and head continue to be bowed, if you have made, said this prayer with me for the very first time, at the count of three, I want you to lift up your hands. By lifting up your hands, you're telling me, Pastor, pray for me. I want to know Jesus. I want to know this God who is so real in your life and and. I want to walk with Him and I want to know Him. If that's who you are, at the count of three, I want you to lift up your hands if you have said that prayer with me. And if you have not said that prayer, you maybe you have said it in your heart, you have said it in your mind, or just somehow you know that you need to lift up your hands and receive this Jesus into your life, I want you to lift up your hands at the count of three. I'm going to count three right now with all our heads bowed and all eyes closed, no one looking around. This is a sacred moment. I'm going to count right now. At the count of three, lift up your hands. One, two, three. Three, lift up your hands. 
Yeah, I see your hands here and over there as well, a few of you. Any more? And as continue to lift up your hands, I want to pray for you. Receive it right now. Receive it right now. Father, I want to pray for my brothers and my sisters who have lifted up their hands. Lord, they are saying to you, Jesus, come into my life. I, I'm frustrated with my life. And I want to declare that over them right now, that Lord, you will show them who you are. And you will show them your purpose. You show them your truth in your word. So that Lord, that they will know you and they will come to, to have a personal relationship with you. So that they can walk according to your will and purposes and not flow according to the culture of this world. So I want to commit them in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Can you just stand up right now and just thank God? Come on, let's just praise God for what He has done in our hearts this afternoon. Come on. Come on, let's just praise Him right now. Woo! You know, friends, if you have said that prayer with me and whether you lift up your hands or not, right after service, I want you to just go to the business lounge uh, right at the corner. And because we want to connect with you, because you are right now a spiritual baby. A spiritual baby cannot see well, cannot walk, do not know how to feed him, himself. And, and we want to help you to know Jesus in your life. We want you to know this God who has great plans for your life. Alright? So, so I just want to encourage you right after this service, go to the visitor's lounge and there will be a pastor who will connect with you personally. And FCBC youth, we need to respond to God today. And this is what we're going to do. We're just going to worship God. I, I do not want to tell you what is the ministry time, what God is wanting you to respond to. But I think it is important that we first worship God. We come in a time of solitude and reflection before God. And I believe that the Holy Spirit will speak to you. That right after the time of worship, when Pastor Guang Han calls for a time of ministry, you will respond automatically. You do not need to hear the voice of a pastor to tell you what to respond to. But of course, later I'll tell you what to respond to. But I believe that God will speak to you. And today, you need to come and respond to God. Or else, I want you to know that I do not want to see our youth growing in the knowledge of this world. But I truly want to see that every single one of you will grow in the knowledge of God's will for your life. That is our worry. If we continue to flow according to the world, we are no different from a Jesus social club. But this is a church. Our lives must be different. We are here to please God. And I want to say to all of you again, as young people, I, we are not here to entertain you. We are not just here to enrich you, but we are here to disciple you. So can we just worship God with this song, No Other Name? I think it's a powerful song that encapsulates the book of Colossians. Because the book of Colossians teaches us about the supremacy of Christ and, and the sovereignty of Christ in our life. And, and today, we need to come before Jesus and say that indeed there's no other name that will bow down. That the, there's no other name that will please other than the name of Jesus and Jehovah. Lord, you see the cry of our hearts, Lord. That each morning when we pray for the youth at 8.30 a.m., Lord, I pray for each one of them that they will shine for you. And I want to declare right now over their lives that they will not live a life that is out to please men, but they will live a life that truly pleases you in every way. And I want to declare this prayer that Apostle Paul has made for the believers 
in the church of Colossae. I want to declare right now in the name of Jesus that I continually ask of you, Lord, to fill them with the knowledge of your will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Holy Spirit gives. And I declare for over every single one of them, they will live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to your glorious might so that they may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified them to share in the inheritance of His holy people in the kingdom of light. But last but not least, I want to declare that they will always remember the cross in their lives. Because, Lord, Your Word tells us in verse 13 onwards, For You have rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son You love, and in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So I want to declare right now, thank You, Lord, for Your Word. I pray that this Word will be ingrained in our spirit, that in all the things that we do, we will desire to please You. That whether is it in our family, whether it's in our school, whether it's in our workplace, that when we truly desire to please You, Lord, we will shine for You because we will counter the cultures of the world with the truth of the Word of God that is evident in our lives. So Lord, we want to give thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we just give thanks to God for this time? And I sense that we need to end off this time by having this fervor boiling in our spirit. I, I think this song is very powerful. Only want to sing. Because it says, what does it say? I, I like this statement. It says, I, you don't want perfection. Just my soul's attention. All I have is what I'll give. God wants your attention. Hello? God wants your soul attention. Are you willing to give or not? Huh? God wants your attention and it's not about performance but it's about a life that pleases God. So can we, can we praise God and let the fire burn within us, let our spirit boil and let's praise the Lord. Come on. Are we ready to praise God? Come on. Woo! Woo! Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, I want to encourage all of you to go and read the book of Colossians. Okay, for this, the next eight weeks, we're going to go through this whole book. Go and read and allow God to speak to you. And remember to invite a friend. And as we leave this place, turn to as many people as you can and say, This is living. This is living. And if you can, wear this shirt along. This is living shirt. So it reminds you to live for God. God bless you.